Welcome to Mulready Minutes with Oklahoma Insurance Commissioner Glenn Mulready. This is a podcast about insurance for insurance folks, risk managers, and business leaders. We'll dive deep and look at what is and isn't working, talk to leaders in the industry, and keep you informed on what's happening in Oklahoma and around the country. Welcome to another Mulready Minute. Uh, we're glad you've joined us and uh, have a, our guest here that was with us not too long ago speaking about a program, but the, the, the great news is that that program has now been um, through the legislature and the governor signed into law. So we're going to talk some detail uh, today with Ashley Scott about that. But first, Ashley joined us at the insurance department in June of 2020 as director of government and community affairs. And then Ashley and I go back a ways as uh, she was uh, worked for a couple different speakers uh, as their policy director. And that was our interaction years ago. And I was able to steal her over um, four years ago pretty much. And so um, Ashley does a great job for us. Uh, previous to that, she then served at the Department of Health here for the state of Oklahoma. So Ashley, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, we're going to talk the Strengthen Oklahoma Homes Act. And we talked at sort of an overview, but let me start with, give just a snippet, a 30,000 foot view. What is the Strengthen Oklahoma Homes Act? Sure. It's a program um, where the department can work in um, correlation with the IBHS um, organization on fortifying homes in Oklahoma through a grant program that we're going to be actually um, developing from the ground up and implementing. And IBHS, Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, yes. is that organization. Yeah. That's what they are about. Um, I also feel like we should give credit to the state of Alabama right now since we kind of stole their idea totally. Definitely. So way to go, state of Alabama. We copied you totally. But um, so let's talk about sort of the internal stuff within us. So the governor signed this two, maybe three weeks ago, just a couple weeks ago. Exactly. So that sets in motion our stuff. So what has to be done internally as we get ready to do this? I, I know right now we're, we're getting contacted, you know, folks are replacing a roof tomorrow right. and they want to know, can they be part of this program? But the answer, quick answer to that is no, they can't. But what's happening or it has to happen internally for us, the law doesn't go into effect till November 1st. Correct. But yeah. uh, what will be happening internally? So between now and November 1st, we are working to um, expedite a um, implementation of an entirely new grant program. We are working with the IBHS um, and their organization as we are going to be using their certified standards. We're going to be working um, with contractors and evaluators to make sure that we have plenty of people across the state to be able to do the work um, once those applications are available. We are also going to be um, working on platforms and application requirements, potentially emergency rules and other um, pieces to ensure that we have all of the information and details available to the public when this program is launched officially. Um, it does go into effect on November the 1st. We're looking and hoping to have applications and first grant dollars to go out in 2025. So that's our, um, you know, a quick turnaround. We've got a lot to do, but we are starting um, from the ground up and, and working through those processes as quickly as we can. Yeah. And so when you say uh, contractors mm -hmm. and then the term evaluators, um, First of all, I guess we'll just clarify. When we say contract, we're talking about roofing contractors, Correct. basically. Yes. And evaluators, talk about that. What, yeah. what's, what's an evaluator? So an evaluator will get a certification through the IBHS in the same manner that a contractor would. Um, they will have to be certified. We will provide a list of those approved um, people so that when a consumer decides to um, apply for the grant that they know who they can use um, and still be using the grant in the appropriate manner and as required by law. But the evaluator is actually someone who's going to come out and look at the roof prior to any um, repairs being done to ensure that the roof can actually be retrofitted with these fortified products and that it's um, possible to do that to those to those roofs. So we have certain requirements that they'll have to look for and making sure that that process can happen before anything is ever approved and applications are, um, you know, moving through that process. So mm -hmm. that will be a big piece for them. Um, the homeowner will have to pay a small fee for that. Um, we're working through what that might look like here in Oklahoma and some other states. It's been a, you know, a few hundred dollars. Um, and that evaluator will work through that entire process, watching as the construction's done on the home, ensuring that all those different steps are met um, so that the roof will meet certification requirements at the end of the construction. Got process. it. So good clarification. That is that, you know, someone just can't jump in and use any roofer that they want. Right. Uh, and that there is a um, check and balance, if you will, with certified evaluators who are 
going to be part of that process. And really, in the end, they're going to go out and inspect and make sure it was done to the IBHS standards Correct. before we release a, a checkout, we, we, before we release that grant out. Yeah, Got exactly. It. So that's there's a lot to happen internally. It doesn't, doesn't happen overnight. Um, so t- tell me about uh, any limitations on, on the program. Uh, you know, what, it, what, what is it that we're doing? What are the IBHS standards? Not a ton of detail, I guess, with that, but how does that sure. work? So there's requirements for the, you know, adhesing the shingles to the decking and, and whatnot. So there's specific ways that they can use those nails and you know, create a stronger bond between the shingle and the decking. They also have different ventilation pieces that are more uh, resistant to high wind and hail. Yeah. And so there's going to be some of those things. And then, of course, the shingles themselves, right? They have to be a class four IR shingle to meet the wind and hail supplement. And so we want to make sure that all of those pieces are um, in place um, for those certification requirements. Yeah, I, I often refer to those really sort of mistakenly as, as hail resistant shingles. I did just yesterday in that hearing, but... Um, Really, I think they call them impact resistant yeah. um, the shingles, mm-hmm. and I know there's just different requirements on fastening and underlayment and taping and that sort of mm-hmm. thing. But uh, that's really what it does, and 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 they'll withstand. I, I forget now, 120, 130 mile yeah, an hour winds bit, is the yeah. idea. But um, and the genesis of this, we might just um, speak to, and that was that. After five years, I discovered I can't really do anything about the weather, <laughs> but we can help folks fortify their home. So this is a step in that in that direction. Um, so um, how about budget constraints or how is this going to work? Where's the money going to come from and how much is available to folks? What does that look like? Sure. So um, what we had asked for in the legislation was basically just to um, allow us to either get state and federal grants or be able to use monies that the department has from um, different um insurance taxes that are paid into the department throughout the year. And so we're hoping to be able to get that money back into people's pockets um, from the insurance company's side and use that for this for this program. We have the ability to use up to $10 million. Um, there is, a, you know, we have to leave at least 50% of our revolving fund intact. So um, any of the dollars above that 50% marker up to the 10 million is what we'll hopefully be able to use uh, moving forward. But of course, with the legislative session, we have to make sure that the budget's been finalized and approved. And so after that July 1 date, when we know exactly what's available, we'll be able to um, have a better idea of how much we'll have to work with and then look at what that grant dollar amount should be moving forward um, for at least this first year. And then we'll reevaluate year to year as we um, have our budgets handled. To the average consumer, Mm -hmm. though, you're, you're replacing your roof, whether from a, heck, we got a bunch of folks right now in Claremore and Barnsdall and sulfur replacing roofs, but right. um, and, and elsewhere. But as you're doing that, what we're doing is we're sort of providing a grant for that upgrade, that that gap between what is standard or what a typical insurance claim would be for, and taking it to that next level to fortify it. But what does that what's that look like? What amount? What's the dollar amount or sure. typical grant might be for? Yep. So um, on average, the information that we have currently is that it's going to cost about $3,000 to do this upgrade for the roof um, with the wind and hail supplement, which is the minimum requirement of the legislation. Um, there are other things that can be done. You could do your windows. You know, if you're building from the ground up, you can do more um, home structure as far as like the, the base of the home and, and building from the ground up. You have a lot more options. But the minimum requirements are the fortified roof with the wind and hail supplement. And so on average, um, you're looking at about a three to $4,000 upgrade there. And so, you know, taking that into um, consideration when we're looking at the grant dollars that we're going to be giving out, um, trying to understand what that should be to make sure we cover all the costs, no matter the size of the home. So I'm a homeowner. I'm hearing this. And um, I would love to have a more fortified home. Um but I also just heard I may have to spend a few hundred dollars to do that. What What's the benefit to me other than a stronger home? Is there any anything that the insurance companies will provide with that? Or? Yeah. So a lot of insurance companies provide a premium discount. Um, we have a range of anywhere from 3% up to 42% here in the state through our filings that we've gotten from insurance companies on um, wind and hail uh, reductions um, for those premiums. So that's a, that's a huge benefit if you are with one of the companies that provides those discounts. The other thing to think about too is with these um, fortified products, you're likely not going to be having to have your roof replaced um, 
every time you get a hailstorm or, or every few years, right? And so you're not going to have those deductibles. Um, with less claim exposure, we're also going to hopefully see um, over time rates just coming down in general across the state. And that's one of the major goals and, and hopes here, with, I think, with our department and, and to help the consumers with those high costs. Yeah. So there is a, a very specific financial benefit mm -hmm. to folks. They would need to look around. That's not a mandated discount, right. so it's not the same. Uh, and I know you'll also want to check with your insurance company uh, on specific products there too. Some of them rate those those shingles a little bit a um, little bit differently. You know, I know that for us with severe convective storms that we get, wind, hail, tornadoes, greater than seventy percent of the dollars of a loss are from roofs. So that's a pretty staggering statistic that we are sort of trying to attack here uh, with this. So this would uh, help them not have a claim, not have to pay another deductible, and receive a discount on their uh, insurance premium. Yeah. Okay, let me shift quickly, Ashley, to um, other states. Tell me, has, has this been done elsewhere? Anyone else contemplating this? What's happening yeah. in that space? There's there's about seven or eight, you know, maybe now 10 with some of those that have passed legislation like we did this past year. Um, Alabama was one of the first to actually implement the program. And it's been in effect, I want to say, six or seven years now where they've been actually giving out grants. And they've seen a great economic impact from the program, which is something else that we hope to bring to Oklahoma. Um, new jobs, you know, these contractors are going to have to have people to do the work if we have, you know, thousand a uh, thousand different homes being redone around the same time that's going to definitely be an increase and in need um, you know people to fill those jobs and make sure that they have the people um, to do all of the work in the time frame set up by the by the law and so there's some things like that then of course retail GDP some of the other things that we could potentially see um, as far as economic impacts to Oklahoma with this program rolling out Good. That's a lot of good information. Uh, we're excited about the program. We were excited pushing it through. Thankful the governor did uh, did sign the bill. And now we can literally start putting money back into Oklahomans' hands uh, to help them fortify their homes. So okay. let me shift gears. Okay. Legislative session just wrapped up. It did. And you head up all of that for us, yeah. too, and do a outstanding job. Um, give me some highlights of some things that we're interested in. The insurance world would be interested in that passed this year in Oklahoma. Sure. So another um, big piece of legislation that we were able to get through the legislature um, and the governor signed was our insurance data security. Um, it's a model law from the NAIC. It was Senate Bill 543. There's about 23 other states that already had this law in place. Um, and then there's been a handful of those that were working through getting um, it passed this last year. So I'm um, excited to be able to move that program through. Um, ultimately, what it does is it sets up um, each insurance company that meets the um, requirements in the law would have to have a program in place and a notification process in place that they would make us aware of for if there's a cyber breach. Um, specifically related to non-public information of consumers. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that things that we've seen, you know, more recently this year, unfortunately, happen, maybe we can have better notice, better notification, consumers be aware of those situations so that they can better protect themselves from potential, um, you know, information being used in, a, in the inappropriate manner, and make sure that we have the ability to protect as much as we can moving forward as those um, breaches are handled. Yeah. Within the insurance company. And I'll add my two cents. I th and great getting that done because the cyber attack world, the space is really um, is really heating up. But Change Healthcare was a dramatic um, cyber attack on February 21st that impacted a lot. Well, every hospital here in Oklahoma, as well as probably half the population was impacted by that. And uh, Tulsa Health System, there was a health system there that had an attack maybe a month or so ago. Mm -hmm. Another Tulsa Health System a year ago had an attack, so this isn't going to slow down. And so this put some measures in place that um, reporting and, and um, require them to uh, so, so we can respond better in, in that. So uh, what else? Um, we do have a regulation that's going in in place. Um, hopefully, we're waiting on the governor to do his declaration. So as long as that works out, then we should be able to roll out some of those provisions. But it's dealing with market surveys for auto body shops. Um, we were getting some complaints about the cost and reimbursement from insurers on auto body shops. And so we had a statute in place that talked about the, cons the um, insurer having to do a market survey of the area and rates and what does that look like. And we just didn't have a lot of um, description 
prescriptive um, regulations to help the insurer know what's what's required. And so we're setting those forward. Um, we're using uh, core-based statistical areas, which is a federally recognized um, CBSA area, and uses census data. And then we're also using um, an average or mean of the different areas within that within that area that they can use to get the um, uh, appropriate numbers for reimbursement for auto body repairs, making sure that we follow manufacturing standards, making sure that the shops can do those based off those manufacturing standards so that people don't end up with, um, you know, go into a shop where maybe they didn't have the appropriate equipment to do it the appropriate way and having further damage down the road and whatnot. But the, the main goal is just to set up um, the reimbursement piece there. So we make sure that insurers across the state are um, reimbursing at the appropriate rates. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Anything else real pressing? Uh, not right now. I think we're just trying to work through um, implementation now of all of the bills that have passed, um, the request bills and then other bills, you know, that have been uh proposed and, and gone through that process this year. So we're working with our teams internally to get those implemented and we'll be getting information out to industry on any of those new changes that they need to be aware of. And then we'll start right back over. So. Yeah, <laughs> start right back over, yeah. she says with enthusiasm. <laughs> hey, thank you, Ashley. I might just take a minute here just uh, because I had the unique opportunity yesterday uh, at this time uh, to um, testify before the U.S. Senate Budget Committee uh, in Washington, D.C. And it was with the um, Senate Budget Committee, but it was about climate and its impact on the insurance world. Um, I did not talk about climate change. I'm not a scientist. That's not my world. But I did speak about the impact of weather on, on insurance claims and what we have seen with some of these, for us here in the Midwest and in Oklahoma, severe convective storms, as we've been talking about, tornadoes and hail and wind. Uh, and then how insurance companies uh, respond to that uh, and, and the impact on premiums and what we can do about that. Uh, I talked about our Strengthening um, Oklahoma Homes Act and talked a lot about mitigation and resilience, that like that is what we can do. And that's what the gov federal government, I think, can incentivize. And they could, they could begin a program just like we've done, but offer federal uh, help or federal dollars or, uh, or FEMA dollars instead of coming in after the fact with FEMA dollars to help and, and, and rescue folks that maybe that money is better spent uh, ahead of that with mitigation. And I know um, you provided to me a while ago, the um, FEMA has their own survey that says that that's a six to one return on dollars invested in mitigation versus on lost dollars. So um, that was the conversation yesterday. Um, if you have two extra hours, you can go online, I'm sure, to the Senate Budget Committee and, and watch that uh, if you find that interesting. But uh, I think that about wraps it up. Ashley, thank you for uh, being with us and sharing about that program. We'll look forward to you working diligently on that and we can start getting that money out into those folks' hands and strengthening those roofs and homes. So, Thank you. Well, that's the end of our uh, latest Mulready Minute podcast. Thank you for joining us. We will see you next time. If you found this episode informative, please subscribe and share with your colleagues. Visit oid.ok.gov slash podcast. Let us know what topics you would like to hear about on this podcast. Until next time, take care from the Oklahoma Insurance Department.